morning, beloved. Good morning. Good morning. We are concluding our sermon series this morning on our identity in Christ. An identity that is now defined as children of God. Someone once asked Charles Dickens what the best short story in the English language was. And his reply was the prodigal son. And I'm inclined to agree. You see, when I think of God, the image my heart conjures before my mind has any time to think is that image of the father in the field watching for his child lost to the world. In Luke 15, 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Before that wasteful but repentant son can ever utter an apology, he was already been kissed, already been embraced, already watched for every day of his absence. Before that prodigal son could ever admit that he was wrong, the father had already come all the way to him. Romans 5, 8 is the very image of God the Father. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The father rejected, his house abandoned for the sake of the world, the inheritance poured out like water on a desert till there was no more of it. Only emptiness and pain and justice remains. But the father poured out his forgiveness more, undeserved but oh so needed, on all of us prodigal sons, if we'd only turn and return to the Father, we find Him standing in the field with arms wide open. We find Him running to us with a love shocking and unexplainable, but true, oh so true. That's who God is to me. And because I know who the Father is, I know who I am, who we are meant to be, the Father desires children, beloved, and He is eager to adopt. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. That's 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 3. First John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. To be called a child of God is to be compared to the Son of God. It is the natural flow of the mind, and it should be, because we are compared to the Son of God. Oh, we fall short. How we fall short of the glory and perfection and honor and wisdom and faith of Christ Jesus. But the righteousness of Christ has been laid upon us at a terrible cost. A price we could not pay, but the price that was paid nonetheless. A debt we cannot repay, but a debt we have been released from nonetheless. Freely given, grace abounds in the family of God, and we knew it to enter into it. We are compared to the Son of God because we are clothed in His righteousness. We are heirs to His inheritance. We are the form of His body and the shape of His kingdom. We bear His name in our own, and Christians carry His cross on our neck, but hopefully more so in our heart. We are compared to Christ Jesus 
Because we are His. And it is by Him that we are sons of God ourselves. Not everyone. Not everyone in the world is a child of God. And not everyone that calls themselves Christian is a child of God. Though we all should be. It is the gift of privilege and the honor of duty of every heir in this family to carry on the family name and to be about our father's business. That's how we live into the adoption. 1 John 1, verses 5 and 6 said, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. <clears throat> if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4 says, And by this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Beloved, this does not mean legalism. It is not about earning unmerited grace. It's about sincerity. It's about walking the walk and being like Jesus. That's what it's always been about, being like Jesus. That is the desire that first turned our hearts away from the darkness of this world and this present age and towards the timeless, eternal light of Jesus Christ. We wanted that light. We wanted to be light. Ephesians 5, 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk. As children of light. Beloved, we have been invited to take a journey upon the path that Christ has trod, Christ has forged with his very flesh, to walk in the light as he is in the light, to shine like the stars in the heavens, to be the children of God that stand out in this world, are set apart in this world for the glory of God. It is no small thing to be called the child of God. It is no small thing to have an inheritance in eternity, a place in the cosmos, and as a prince at that, ever and always a seat for you at the Father's table because you, more than anything else in the world, are cherished as the family of God. That is the identity invested in you by the cross. Forgiven, washed clean, made new, born again into a holy and an imperishable family. And I don't know where you came from. I don't know your people. Maybe it wasn't the best. I know the new family that you are invited into. And though we are not perfect, we strive to be. The Holy Spirit is making us over time, in His time, into the thing that you need. What we all needed, and needed to be. Maybe your father wasn't a good man. And maybe your mother wasn't the image of unconditional love that she was supposed to be. God is. We all bring our hang-ups and baggage to words like family and father and relationships. But all those failings, all those broken roads should instead teach us what he is not. So that we can better appreciate who he is all the more. What we need him to be, he is so much more. The father that we need. The family that we need. The future we can have. If we have a heart become a child of God as the Son of God. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. The call and title is to be radically different. To act like children of God, frankly. We don't always do a good job of that. But we're always invited we must not be like the world, not anymore. Christ wasn't like the world. His kingdom was not of this world. So we have to be different. Not just a little bit. Not just a bit off, as the world would say. We have to be noticeably different as he was. 
The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. If the world knows us, if the world recognizes us as one of their own, well, we have work to do then. As Jesus was, we must be. Our understanding of the identity of Jesus is that He died to forgive the unforgivable. Radically different. Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 6.5. He was chosen as one of the first seven deacons of the church. Full of grace and power, he did great wonders and signs among the people. He was radically different. And we know what the world does to that. On an unjust trial, he stood firm in his faith. He proclaimed truth to the world. Instead of testifying to his own innocence, he testified the story of God, his unfailing love to a fallible people that disobeyed their father in heaven and killed his son. Instead of repentance, they responded in stones. The text says in Acts 7, 57, they stopped their ears rather than hear the truth and hurled stone after stone to kill him. Stephen, the first martyr after the cross, as he died, proclaimed the glory of God in the most Christian way possible. Forgiveness. Acts 7, 16. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. He said this. Die. Stephen, in the moment of his death, was the very image of a son of God. Because he was most like the son of God, who forgave the unforgivable as he was being killed. Luke 23, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't know that I have the courage of Stephen or his heart. And I pray that I am not led into the test, but when tested, that the grace of God would shine through me instead of the darkness of the world merely mirrored back upon me. A woman by the name of Heather Thompson Day said that her student killed a motorcyclist in an accident. It destroyed him. He dropped out of school, severe depression, Want to know what pulled him out of it? The parents of the man who killed him. They asked him to meet for dinner. He goes now once a year. Forgiveness is healing. As Christ is, so must we be. So can we be. Now. Now that we have tasted his forgiveness. Now that we have been washed in grace, we can be radically different. We can forgive the unforgivable too. We can be children of God. We can pray for our persecutors and love our enemies, drawing them close as neighbors, love those neighbors into brothers, and defeat our enemies, not with sticks, or stones, or words made to hurt me. The Christian way is to defeat them by transforming them into brothers, as we were conformed to the brothers of Jesus Christ. In a world of loud voices, echo chambers, canceling, and endless anxiety and strife, be a forgiver. Be a calm voice of understanding. Be a cool-headed listener. Be a peacemaker. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We are all of us made by God. But to be children of God, we have to act like Him. By acting like Him. Radically different.
We can stop focusing on what divides. We can stop being led by the nose by the dark forces of this world that profits from our division. And we can focus on Christ's mission to unite us as one. God placed a prophecy in the mouth of Caiaphas before the cross. In John 11, verses 51 and 52, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Under one banner, God gathers his children. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I don't care about your isms, or your blood feuds, or your tribal warfare. There is only one race that matters, the children of God. We are by design to be a motley myriad of many faces, many tongues, many nations, and all of us, every one of us, are gathered under our same Father by the same need of redemption and the same gift of grace. Everything else is foolishness. All that matters is our shared eternity in God, our adopted Father. Hebrews 2, verses 11 through 15. For he who sanctified and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There are only two races. Because we are not all children of God, though we all can be, and we must be, because the alternative is to be a child of the devil. There is no middle ground. 1 John 3, verses 4 through 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Come. Come as you are. But leave your sin at the door. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Die to it. And live in Christ. Live and love your brother. He too has the same need as you. A need he can't meet any more than you could. A need Christ has met as much as he has met yours. After that, what matters? What is there that man can build up and divide that Christ has not torn down and bound together in his love? Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 7. 
And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. All the sin and the wrongheadedness of the world. But God, rich in mercy, He changed our lives. Christ did not die for us to remain divided. Christ did not die for us to hate our brother. Our brother, because of the differences in his skin, his nation, his language, He did not die for us to hate our brother's denomination die, that we, all of us, could die to sin and live by the same mercy the world could not kill, so we shouldn't seek to destroy it. Romans 8, verses 14 and 15, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We are called from every walk of life to stop walking in the world, regardless of where we started, to end in the same place, to have the same Father, to be our brother's keeper. Every child of God is so called not by blood, but by the blood. John 1, 11 and 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There is a war. The only war there ever was, a civil war, brother against brother. Ever since Cain rose in the field to ensure that Abel would not. The death count was heavy, with an attrition rate of 100%. And God could not stand it anymore. Sir Harry Louder, who lost his only son in the first great world war, was visited in New York by a man who told him a beautiful and touching story. In American towns, any household that had given a son to the war was entitled to place a star on the window pane. Well, said Sir Harry, a few nights before he came to see me, this man was walking down a certain avenue in New York, accompanied by his wee boy. The lad became very interested in the lighted windows of the houses and clapped his hands when he saw the star. As they passed house after house, he would say, Ooh, look, Daddy, there's another house that has given a son to the war. And there's another and that one has two stars. And look, there's a house with no star at all. At last they came to a break in the houses. Through the gap could be seen the evening star shining brightly in the sky. The little fellow caught his breath. Oh, look, Daddy. God must have given his son, for he got a star in his window. He has indeed, said Sir Harry, when he repeated the story. You see, there is one son that died to end the war. The victory has been determined, and the other side won. We lost. And when the conqueror came to claim his prize, his trophies, his prisoners of war, instead he dashed our chains, cupped our chins with compassion, and calls us brothers. That's who we are. 
every one of us. We were all on the wrong side. We just didn't know it. Blinded by darkness, by full-headedness, by the surety of self-righteousness, we were all on the wrong side. Till Jesus came to forgive us and unexplainably call us brothers. All of us. After that, what matters? What can still divide? You decide. You decide if His grace is sufficient. You decide if His blood was enough. You decide if His love is all we need. You declare the answer by how much you live out His life and yours. The Father in heaven, that good, good Father, standing out in the field to catch a glimpse of all the prodigals and call them home. He's eager to adopt. He's eager to forgive and give all that He has. See, we're stuck in a zero-sum mentality. We war and we covet and we lose. So how is it that I can inherit everything from the Father and you can inherit everything from the Father and you and you and you? How is it that we can all inherit everything from the Father? Because the Father has infinite resources. He has all of eternity. And a share of infinity is still infinity. You can have and quarter and divide it up amongst a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a million, billion, trillion people, and it is still eternity. The Father is all the answer that we need. We know who God is. And we've learned who we're meant to be. The question I ask is, who do you want to be? Do you want to follow the Prince of Peace or the Prince of the Power of the Air? Do you want to be a peacekeeper or a child of wrath? A son of God or a son of rebellion? Do you want to breathe life into the world and make new brothers or speak death and darkness? Whose child are you? Who do you want to be? Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both, both grow until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And now to verses 36 to 43, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. There is only one race that matters. One family and if you are hearing these words, it is not too late to switch sides. It is not too late to surrender to the conqueror of Christ and let him transform you into something radically different. Someone like him. A child of God, too. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. you have never known Jesus, today you can ask to receive Him and be free. And if you have lived in the church your whole life but have never known Jesus, today you can ask to receive Him and be free. And if you have known Jesus but you have lost your way, you're stumbling in the darkness of the world, you're no longer radically different but completely the same, forgotten your first love, today you can ask to be reminded that knowing Him is free. The Toronto Globe published this story. One day I saw a peddler, evidently an Irishman, selling wares from door to door. I accosted the man with the usual greetings, after which I remarked, It is a grand thing to be saved. Hey, said the peddler, it is. But I know something better than that. Better than being saved, I asked in astonishment. What can you possibly know better than that? The companionship of the man who saved me was his reply. We aren't just to be called the children of God. That is not enough. It's not enough for God. He wants us to be children of God. He wants us to come into the house of our Father, put our feet up, raid the pantry, do our chores, and mind our Father, to look like Him, to carry on the family name, to be no less a child for the adoption, but every bit as much because of His choice for you. Who are you in Christ? You are a child of God. You are to bear the very image of Jesus. And more than what you say, but how you say it, why you say it, what you do and why you do it, radically different from the world because you are no longer of the world and they will know you on sight because you look like your brother Jesus Christ. There is a family resemblance so as no one even knows that you are adopted anymore. That's what you are called to be. That's what you can be. That's what we need to be. The children of God. We have to be what we are called to be. We get to be who we are called to be. No more wrath, no more rebellion, no more perdition, no more fellowship with darkness because you are too busy calling brothers out of the dark. Though the work is hard as it was for Christ, though the work is costly as it was for Christ, you are for Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want to be who he says I am. Heavenly Father, I fear that in the grace of our adoption, your church has been so infected by the world that we spend much of our time saying, you're not my real dad. When we have forgotten who we are meant to be, Lord, I don't want to be the same anymore. Lord, I don't want to be wrapped up in the status quo. Lord, I don't want to be just like everybody else. I am tired of this. I am tired of your church conforming to the world. I am tired of us 
being lazy, being fearful, going along to get along. I'm tired of this load, not having the courage to be radically different. Lukewarm water isn't good enough. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. All our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. And we've been giving you Cain's sacrifice. Just some. Just some. Lord, we need to give you all. We need to surrender all. We need to give the first fruits of our heart. We need to take seriously the lessons that you have given us, the example that you have shown, the person that you are. There is a feast on the table of our Father, and we've been picking at scraps. We've been a picky eater. When a buffet of virtue and grace, forgiveness, kindness, brotherly love, wisdom, sincerity, all these things are ours for the taking, Lord. And the church has grown anemic and weak because we don't eat. You have already given us the feast. We can't ask. For the feast, Lord, it's right there. We ask, Lord, that you make us hungry. Hungry for your word. Hungry for truth. Hungry for something real in this world full of lies. Make us hungry for truth. That we may live out truth. And if we merely hold to truth in this world, we will stand out as being radically different in a sea of lives. This is serious, Lord. It is difficult, it is challenging, it is costly, it's sacrifice. How can we not sacrifice? As you have sacrificed for us. We have been forgiven, and we deserve justice. How is it that we can cling to vengeance when you have taught us grace? Strip away, Lord, the spirit of fear that keeps whispering lies into our ears, that we may hear the truth and cling instead to the spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. And let us boldly be sons of God. Let us boldly stand before the great sea of darkness in the world and say, oh yeah, <laughs> oh my dad can be the Lord dad. And let us cling to the victory that our Father in heaven provides charge forward into this world. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, Lord, of what you make us into. Let us be your children, Lord, and be about our Father's business. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.